Welcome to the Nurture Series, the place where we nurture ourselves back to greatness. I'm your host, Chava Florin, and we're about to get groovy together and fostering the best practices towards living our best lives, nurturing ourselves, our relationships, our spirit, and our bodies. Welcome to the Nurture Series. Hey guys, welcome back to the Nurture Series. You guys know I love bringing you really good people who really know interesting ways that we can really get back to ourselves, nurture ourselves and nurture our relationships. This week, um, I have a fantastic coach I'm excited to introduce you to. He happens to be a relationship coach. He used to be an engineer, decided to go back and do what his passion is, which is helping people. And he became a relationship coach. His name is Arno Kutch. He lives right here in California in Malibu. And we talked a lot about different ways to approach communication. This is something that I love talking about. You may have noticed one of my other interviews with Lauren Weinstein happens to be a communication coach. She had some really great ways of talking about communication. So if you like this episode, go and listen to that one as well. I highly recommend it. This week, we talked to Arno about different ways and tactics that we can calm our nervous system down when we're in the middle of a conflict. Um, Conflict resolution is one of those things we're all really talking about, getting more in tune with, wanting more answers around. Um, Our emotions are running high post-pandemic. Now there's other things that couples are dealing with, like financial um, woes and just an overall sense of, you know, needing to get back to one another using better tactics than we've used in the past sometimes. And Arno and I talk a little bit about other ways to calm ourselves down, but also certain phrases that really work when it comes to having more compassionate communication. Welcome to the show, Arno Kutch. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for coming on to the Nurture Series. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I'm really excited too. So tell us a little bit about your background and what you do, Arno. I'm excited for our guests and our listeners to hear about some of the wonderful advice you have to give them on how to live a more nurturing life. My background, I'm I'm an engineer by trade. I worked as an engineer in Germany, as a product manager in Switzerland, and then I came to the U.S. in 2015 and um, and, uh, business development. And um, as my expat contract ended, I started to follow my passion and became a professional coach. That's business fantastic. coach at the time. Thank you. Business coach at the time. And was I know, what I noticed was, as I started working with, with clients, um, coincidentally, or synchro, synchro, synchronistically, right? There are no coincidences. Um, they were struggling in their relationships. The word divorce was on the table. And by the end of the coaching program, they were happily in love again. And I realized... Or I asked myself, how did that happen? I didn't, we didn't work on relationships. Their partner was not even involved whatsoever. How did that happen? Um, and what I realized was that I had them practice everything about communication with their partners. So I said, hey, use your husband, use your wife as your sparring partner to ingrain the things that you need in difficult uh, business situations uh, on a daily day-to-day basis with your partner, with your kids. And that elevated the relationships. And when I realized how well that was working, I thought I'll just I'll g- just give it a try and work with people on relationships and uh, had great results right off the bat and have been passionate about it ever since. What are some things that you think are patterns that you notice that occur on, on- kind of I'm talking more general broad scale but is there a particular pattern pattern that you pick up on that you notice quite often in your practice amongst couples who are trying to couple better yeah 100 percent um taking expressions of frustration personal is a big pattern Mm. because most of the time there was not a sniper shot fired at us there was a blow up and we just were too close and trapped now went into our into in our di- direction and noticing that hurt people hurt people and that is a hurt person right in that moment in front of us 
that needs love and, and attention and affection and kindness and holding space can make a big, big difference instead of trying to trying too hard to make the other person happy. Because we do try to make the other person happy and that's good. And that's, we, we should, we should be moved if, if our partner is unhappy. Um, but trying too hard can, can backfire. And it can also lead to then taking it personal. Well, he, she should respond positively to me being nice and, and trying to, to make him her happy. Why is she not doing that? I should be that special person. Am I not that special? You know, and then, and then the own uh, thought cascade starts going off. And, and then it goes more into direction of escalation than, uh, than calming things down. And often, often the only thing we can do in such a situation is show an act of kindness. Right? We can ask if the other person is open to speak, get permission, and we need permission for that. Or if we don't ask permission for permission and we stumble into that, accepting that they're not open in that moment and showing an act of kindness, can I do anything for you, offering something or just, just doing something, bringing them a glass of their favorite beverage. Do you um, think it's about um, creating more space for someone who seems upset or is it engaging in that space? What do you think is a better practice when somebody, one of the partners it look, is upset? Um, it depends. If the other person is too frustrated, too angry, too sad, it's about creating space. Because in that moment, what is that? What is anger? What is frustration? It is stress hormones, cortisol, and adrenaline flowing through our bodies. And, and I, think, I think it's also making sure that the partner who's not upset doesn't take the other person's experience personally. Exactly. Yes. And, and I think that and, happens a lot. Right. So like yeah. you're upset. So now I'm upset that you're upset, which makes the other person upset, not allowed to feel upset. Yeah, ex exactly. They have stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline inside of them, and they're looking, seeing the world through a certain lens right now. So, so they're interpreting anything that is, that is, that reaches their senses now and observe those things if there's a threat or not, try to find threats. And no matter words you utter, you can always understand them in a, in a threatful way. So if the energy is in that level, that person needs some space to metabolize those stress hormones, not to become happy again, but to metabolize the stress hormones and an act of kindness, showing them that they're cared for <clears throat> and holding space saying, okay, um, if you want to talk about it, let me know. I'm, I'm reading in the living room. I'm there for you. So now that you have created an environment where they know they're cared for and they can take their time to, to metabolize those stress hormones and then and come back to you and say, hey, yeah, I had such, an, such a horrible experience at, at work today. And you're like, oh, it wasn't even about me. I remember I went, by my, I went to the, I approached my wife. She was in her, in her office, in her bedroom working. And I asked her how she was doing. She, she was at a dentist that day. And she said, oh, it's horrible, I had a root canal. And I'm like, oh, can I do anything for you? Yeah, if you could bring me a glass of ice water. Okay, I'm gonna do that. And as I was pouring that glass of water, I was like, the expression on her face after a root canal is the exact same expression on her face when she's mad at me. Yes, I'm a relationship coach. And even though I'm a relationship coach, my wife can get mad at me. I'm in a real relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I told her that, and she couldn't smile in that moment, but it was um, because her, her face was numb. Um, but it was interesting. So what you're saying is, is that a lot of times <clears throat> husbands or wives will mistaken their spouse or their partner or girlfriends or boyfriends will mistaken their partner for being angry at them when really they're just angry at something else, you know? Yeah, along yeah. the lines of what, what, you, what you just said, not take things personal, uh, they're likely not. And even if they are, you'll be in a better state to find a solution for the common problem with your partner than treating them as a wolf. Well, there is an interesting segue, finding a solution for the partner. So <laughs> I, I'm curious what, you, what your thoughts are on that, because sometimes I think that 
men like to find solutions and women prefer men to just not give a solution. <laughs> I'm curious how you feel about that, being the man in your relationship. <laughs> not yes. to be so overgeneralized. Obviously, that's a very general um, comment. Um, but I do notice that, that men tend to want to give a solution and women are just like, I didn't ask for a solution. Just want you to hold my space in the moment. <laughs> I, I wonder where that where that impression comes from. <laughs> no, I have a I have a word for that, that that my wife actually taught me, and it really helped me. She said she said, "Can you stop mansplaining things to me?" And I absolutely love that. And I I, I coined the word womansplaining because it goes both directions. That absolutely, <clears throat> men are more guilty of that. Um, and in it's order just that to, when when women women explain, it's because they're usually right. <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, hundred hundred percent. Um, because what they say is true to them, <laughs> right? And we get, we we need to acknowledge that, right? So, um, in order to help anyone, we need permission. If yeah. we don't have permission to help, we're not helping. I like that. That's a yeah. really good thing. That's so, great. So asking that question, do you just want to share right now or would you would you like my opinion? That, that can help. Checking that in, asking yes, what you mean. In. Yeah, asking for that. And, mm -hmm. and if the answer is no, and this is a, one thing that, that I also just I, I repeat endlessly, offering your partner a true choice. And a true choice means that no matter which option they pick, you find appreciation for that. Of course, you have a preference. It doesn't mean pretending you don't have a preference, but being able to appreciate it. So if you ask for help, you have an idea already, you have that urge to share it, but asking for it, and when you hear a no, finding appreciation for they're not open for that. And as they're not open, even if I shared it now, well, that would probably have a negative influence on this energy that we have as a, as a couple right now. It would absolutely break the rapport we have and, and, and it would not be useful. With my wife, sometimes I ask her and she would say no. As she says no, that is also a part of the release process. She releases anger and frustration in that moment as she says no. And then I say, okay, that's fine. And lo and behold, five minutes later, she, she sometimes sometimes says, okay, tell me. But now she's open. Yeah. And if she doesn't, it's fine because I know asking her in that way changes the likelihood that I'm able to share something that will actually be heard. And that's such a big thing in communication. When we communicate effectively, that just means we shift the likelihood, we shift the odds to being heard better and to hearing better. It's not, effective communication is not a magic trick to get your thing through. There is no efficient communication. There's only effective communication and that only shifts the likelihood. And acknowledging that can, can really put you at ease in those difficult situations. Uh, you and I talked a little bit in the pre-interview about some of the crossover that we both have in terms of helping people get through um, becoming more emotionally resilient <clears throat> the work that I do as um, a masterclass teacher and a coach is very similar to what you do in terms of getting people to be very sort of uh, clued in to what they're feeling. Because the more you know what you feel, the more you're able to then communicate what that is to your partner. I, I'm curious about your process in terms of, I know that as a relationship coach, you are helping people get to better know themselves and through getting to better know themselves, they have a better chance of getting to know their partner. What are some exercises that you might put um, your clients through? If somebody was booking a, a uh, session with you, what would that look like? What would, what would their, what's your process exactly? <clears throat> Effective <laughs> communication means to me, if, first of all, communicating effectively with myself. And communicating effectively with myself means mastering my state of being, which is comprised of the four substates, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual state. And changing each one of those substates has a ripple effect to the other states. So changing one of those substates changes change them all. So usually you'd find yourself in a cascade of sad feeling comes up, emotional. Then you rearrange your body in space. 
You start breathing shallow, your shoulders move forward, your chin goes down, a camera would now capture your sad. Then you start talking to yourself. You change your mental set, your focus and your thought. So your focus is now on that sadness and your thoughts might go like, okay, um, why is he doing that? Well, of course, the man is wrong, right? He did something. Um, why, why, why is he doing that? I t that makes me really sad. I told him I don't like that. Um, why is he still doing that? Actually, I can even remember a situation where he didn't do it. So I told him he has heard it and he has, he has brought it to action. So as he has really understood it, that must mean he's doing it on purpose now. Why is he doing it on purpose? How do I deserve being handled, being treated like that on purpose? And then that sadness gets stronger. Maybe that gets anger uh, connected with that. Then more things. Oh, and he also did this. So that's that thought cascade. And that changed then the spiritual state, the energy and the beliefs we have in a moment. So the energy goes down or low vibration and beliefs. Sure, religious beliefs may be part of that, but also local beliefs like, okay, here we go. Now we're going to fight for the next three hours or global beliefs. Maybe this relationship is not meant to be. That's an example how those four substates interact. And now you can influence each and every one of those substates. So for example, physically, when you find yourself in that moment of sadness and that moment, moment of anger, look, monitor your body, take a deep breath, pull your shoulders back, pull your chin up and express a state of confidence. Now, as oh. you do that, as your unconscious mind is, is, connects the mind and the, and the body and, and, and the heart, now your unconscious mind goes like, oh, we were, we were frustrated and releasing uh, stress hormones a minute ago. Maybe we're, we're not in that state anymore. So we can, we can start metabolizing those. We express confidence. You can also, if the situation stresses yourself out, you can remind yourself, what do I like about my partner? And as you think of those things that you like, that will create positive emotions. So now you override, consciously override the negative emotions with positive emotions again. You can also reframe, like you can say, okay, and then there are meaning reframes and context reframes. Is there a moment where I could appreciate my wife doing that? For example, if she gets intense in an argument, I'd be like, okay, if she'd be out there right now with my son and someone was, was threatening him, I would want her to show up in that freaking way. Mm. And I would be unhappy if she didn't. But as she is she and how you do something is how you do everything, I need to be okay with her defending herself towards me in the same way. So now there's a context where I can appreciate that and now I can be okay with her speaking to me in that way or I can look at the meaning and say as she raises her voice what else could that mean maybe she's not feeling heard if I make her feel heard now maybe that will that will change how she's how she talks to me and then I can try that and maybe that works maybe it doesn't work and then I can say okay maybe there's a different meaning and and reframe the situation and then just spiritually taking a step back Having a bit of a meditation, that's probably something I, I, I rather do after a situation like that to get back into a positive state um, or, or put on some music. So, so there are very specific ways we can, we can target each one of those four substates that can make a big, big difference in, after, or before an intense conversation. That is fantastic. I love all of these suggestions. I'm going to use all of them. <laughs> I think it's great. I think, you know, um, one of the things I teach my clients is how to kind of feel their feelings. One of the things I notice is that sometimes people avoid feeling distress with using ways to distract themselves, whether it be just scrolling on their phone or distracting themselves by binging on Netflix or distracting themselves by shopping, whatever it is that we're doing, you know, to create a distraction so we don't feel the feelings. Um, I also teach a meditation and a way to re, you know, invest in our emotional experience. And I'm curious um, what you teach your clients in terms of when somebody is experiencing pain, distress, emotional discomfort, grief, suffering, the emotional suffering state, what are some tools that you give your clients so that they can 
feel it and then move past it. Yeah. So, so now we're not talking about managing the, the mastering the own state, but but mastering the communication. I call that using love-based language with the other person that helps not only love them but help them feel loved. And uh, one thing that I found. Yeah. Let's very, talk is, about that. I like that. <laughs> let's talk about that. <laughs> Well, one thing that I found is, is very powerful is asking a question instead of, because empathy and compassion is such a fickle thing. If I, if I tell you how you feel and it's true and you like it, we're golden. You feel so, so acknowledged and heard and everything. But if it's just a little bit off, it breaks the connection. Meaning like and if some, if one spouse is like, I'm upset that you did A, B, and C and the other spouse doesn't respond with, I'm hearing you. Instead, they respond with defensiveness or stonewalling or what any of those, you know, yeah. apocalypse things. How do you avoid that? Or, or if I see that my, my partner is angry and I say, why are you angry? And, and she or he will say, I'm not angry, right? <laughs> so so you, you, you either just a little bit off they're frustrated, they're not angry, or you say the right feeling, but they don't like how they feel. Breaks the connection too. So- Give me an example, what does that mean? Yeah, you know, for example, uh, why are you angry? And they're angry, they're absolutely angry. And they say, I'm not angry. They don't mm-hmm. like how they feel. They don't like that they're angry. They don't, they don't wanna be angry on a, on, a, on a deep level. So- So they're avoiding the- Yeah. So, so rephrasing that and saying, <laughs> something like and it's so so powerful starting the sentence with one of three almost almost magic words it seems like it looks like or it sounds like it sounds like you're really frustrated about something right now and as you do that first of all you're not mansplaining you're, you're not accusi- you're not accusatory yeah you're showing that you might be wrong i just it just seems to me right you show that you put some effort in I thought about it, I thought about it, I really tried to get you, and it seems to me. And if you can direct that thing outside, something is frustrating you right now. So now it's something out there that is, it's not you're angry, you're the problem. It's not I'm seeing you angry, I'm the problem. There's something out there that's frustrating you, and that's valid that it's frustrating you. Let's both look at that thing and talk about that. So now I've done three things by using one of three simple words. And this also s- such a beautiful thing about coaching. Everybody has used those words. Seems like it looks like it sounds like we use that in, in happy, positive com- conversations all the time. But becoming conscious of this of this technique, so to speak, and translating it into different and in difficult situations can be all it takes. I've not taught my client anything new in that moment. I just created a little bit more context, gave them ideas. And now they and now it comes to practice. They need to practice it now, consciously practicing that. And it's easy to practice those things even when things are not heated yet. Maybe even more powerful. And things don't get heated at all. At all. I love that. I think this is fantastic advice. And uh, and, and I think it's going to help a lot of people in terms of how they can approach difficult conversations. Yeah. Because I think what happens is is when these conversations, the difficult conversations, when the emotional experience gets too hot, right? That's when there's some breakdown. And it's yeah. during those moments of breakdown that create sort of a, a disconnection. And what you're training people to do is not to get to the place of disconnection, but to stay in the place of compassionate connection. Yeah, yeah. Ideally that, and then return from that place of disconnect as well. So uh, if people want to get a hold of you, Arno, give us some intel. What are different ways that we can get a hold of you and get some skills around coupling better? Sure. So uh, imagine-evolution.com is my website. I also have the, have the web address arnokoch.com, which di- redirects to Imagine Evolution. And uh, I've just recently noticed when you put my name, Arno Koch, a-R-N-O-K-O-C-H into Google. The first page is plastered with, with, with things. So that's, uh, that's easy. There's my Instagram, underscore Arno Koch, LinkedIn. Uh, all those things work very well. And we will have all of Arno's information at the bottom of the page on our, uh, on our Spotify and all the wonderful links that you guys will have for 
this particular episode. Thank you so much for being here tonight, today, and for giving us your wonderful advice and for inspiring us to live better, nurture ourselves and our relationships. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Nurture Series with Chava Florin. Catch us next time. Nurture This.